you. You have recently co-authored a white paper on global technological standards titled Strengthening EU-US Cooperation on Technical Standards in an Era of Strategic Competition. Could you just briefly summarize the main takeaways of your paper? What are your main findings? Yes, absolutely. And thanks very much uh, for the invitation to speak today. Thanks, Oscar, for the good introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think, uh, first and foremost, I should say um, this is a co-authored paper between the volume group GMF and IFRI and a co-author John Siemens. So I want to I wanna give him the uh, tip of the hat here for helping me out with, with this paper. And uh, I, I just want to put this paper in the context of the work the volume group has been doing over the past few years. Um, we have been interrogating the effect of rising geopolitical tensions, and especially, of course, US-China tensions on business as usual, quote unquote, economic flows, uh, investment flows, trade flows. And over the past few years, we've uh, started interrogating the effect of the geopolitical tensions on standard um, organization standardization, international standardization work. And so um, that paper falls into that um, effort. We've been trying first and foremost, and especially to put numbers and economics in the center of a very national security driven debate um, when we speak about US China decoupling and just bringing back the economic arguments here. Um, and so this is what we tried to do with this paper in the run up to the now past TTC uh, to try and give recommendations to uh, US and EU policymakers in, in uh, their process of uh, updating or thinking about their standardization strategy. Uh, so in that context, I think there are really three main kinds of findings in um, our latest paper. Um, the first one is that, you know, from a geopolitical lens, we see uh, that global cooperative technical standards, um, activities, organizations are under concrete pressure from rising geopolitical tensions, and especially US-China tensions. Um, we are seeing, and we have seen over the past few years, more and more debates, of course, emerge around the role of China in SDOs and especially its level of influence um, on certain standardization uh, works and organization. Um, and we can speak, of course, about whether those concerns are warranted. There's a lot of debate, actually, about what the extent of China's influence is. Uh, but in any case, uh, there's a distinct growing worry that emerges from those debates that Chinese companies and Chinese leaders through those companies could use global standards, uh, global standard setting organizations to shore up China's competitive advantage, favor uh, Chinese companies and Hong Kong technologies at the expense of the US and the EU, uh, and overall gain an advantage on uh, industries of the future. Um, there's also a concern um, that these actions could turn, uh, could in turn endanger national security, economic resilience, political resilience in some of those nations. Once again, we're focusing on the EU and the US here. Um, the second finding is that these rising concerns are really putting pressure on uh, standard setting, standard development organization in three main ways. Uh, they're leading to a number of leading, uh, they're leading to a number of disruptive actions, uh, of course, by the US, but um, other uh, other participants to advanced economies in particular of the kind of export restrictions put on Huawei in 2019, which of course, for a moment, trickled down at the standard setting level and uh, threatened to harm some of the daily work of telecommunication in particular standard organization that's been reversed in 2020, but those kinds of actions have an effect on the SDOs. Uh, there's no question about that. The second effect is just leading to the creation of alternative organizations, which for the moment are uh, granted small and, and not that powerful minilaterals, for example, of the kind of the Quad and the TTC. Um, but those have alternative standards agenda. And so there's there's a potential here, should those organizations grow to hollow out some of the standardization work that has been residing in the more private oriented, commercially oriented standard development setting organizations that we know. Um, and finally, um, a third effect, which is um, at the extreme that some of those tensions, geopolitical tensions could affect participation of certain players, key players, China, the US, EU, in certain SDOs, um, if either of China's or the US's actions were to create uh, kind of a, a, a decrease in engagement appetite uh, in those organizations. So thinking about this, just seeing that really geopolitical pressures are uh, putting standard uh, global standard work and global standard organization under pressure. Um, the second thing that comes out of the paper is probably um, the fact that in the context of heightened geopolitical competition, there's actually a better case and, and a new case for 
for uh, global collective uh, standardization work. And so this is one of the key arguments in the paper, central one, to say, if you have geopolitical anxieties, instead of throwing everything out, and we've said that about other areas of uh, US-China competition, um, there's actually a, a case for doubling down uh, on some of those activities because they are um, a, a barrier to certain geopolitical risks that are emerging at the moment. Uh, they're not just, and standards are not just contributing to growth, trade, and economies of scale. So those are really the trend, kind of traditional arguments for global standards. Um, but what we find and what we put out is that they're enablers of resilient and flexible value chains, which is really front and center in, in EU and US de-risking strategies at the moment. Why? Because they make supply chains more malleable and adjustable. They're also enablers of fair competitions in third markets. And so if you're thinking and worried about belt and road competition and Chinese competition, in especially emerging developing economies, um, having global collectively developed or set standards is a good thing because um, it creates the basis for rational choice, diversity, and continued open competition. Um, a, th a third argument to that to that um, uh, to that point is to say that uh, global and globally set standards foster scaled up innovation, of course, reduce costs, and improve products, uh, which allow not just Chinese, but certainly EU and US firms to face, especially Chinese competition from a stronger foundation. And so if you want to win the competitive uh, uh, race against uh, China, which is some of the way uh, that some of the policymakers are framing these geopolitical uh, risk and tensions, uh, then actually you're better off with global standards. And finally, and this is more thinking about pandemics and, and climate, focusing on uh, uh, focusing energies and engineering and scientific efforts into one single collaborative forum is the best way to scale up uh, and allow the development of technologies uh, to solve some of those common global challenges. So extremely important here. In addition to this, we lay out a few recommendations, specific ones in the paper, but let me stop here maybe for the moment and we can get back to that in a minute. Great, thank you. Very, very, very interesting. Um, Nigel, let me go to you. In the last year or so, decoupling, bifurcation were certainly the words of the day, particularly when discussing the relationship with the United States and China. Yet the analysis that Agatha just summarized suggests that when it comes to technological standards, on balance, the United States might be better off by avoiding fragmentation and preserving global standards. Would you agree with this? Would you, do, how do you see China? Is China a threat when it comes to technological standards? Yeah, completely agree in that the US is a global leader in advanced technologies in part due to the open, voluntary, industry-led and consensus-based way in which international standards are, standards are made. In essence, it's, it's the secret source that translates US innovation and ingenuity into actual standards power because it's open, it's competitive, uh, it's industry driven. So it's it's not state directed, it's not top down directed. So the best technology and experts win. And it, it's a frustrating part of this concern where there are about China's growing role in setting standards in, in that there's a disproportionate focus on participation and submissions rather than on how how well they sort of are engaged and the quality of their submissions because true standardization power and influence comes from writing practically and technically robust standard submissions and quite often this is this is most evident early in um, the technical standard setting process in that the, uh, the expert that submits early uh, submits a well-drafted standard early essentially forms the basis for discussions that ultimately sort of lead to final formal standards. And that's where the true sort of standardization power comes from. Um, but yet what we've seen thus far in many SDOs, especially government-based SDOs like the International Telecommunications Union, is this false equation of uh, Chinese uh, participants assuming leadership positions and the number of submissions that Chinese firms are submitting to uh, standards committees at the ITU. And they don't equate to standards power because what matters is the quality of the submissions. And, and what we've seen as well is that like there's incentives in China for Chinese firms to go and make submissions. And so they will go to the ITU and other SDOs, they will file these submissions and then essentially leave 
and won't even try and stay and defend them. And so, which highlights uh, the need for us to put China's growing engagement and international standards setting in its proper context and ensure that we focus on what matters in terms of the quality of the standards, but also focusing on what matters in terms of what leads to good standards. And that's the governance of these standards development organisations. As long as these are the essential guardrails that protect against the type of top down country sort of mandated standards that are, are more akin to what we see in China. If we have open consensus based uh, uh, voting based SDOs, they are the, the guardrails against any one firm or group of firms from one country sort of pushing something through. And when we've been talking about China and this bifurcation and, and its growing impact on, on international standards, I don't think the governance, the good governance of standards body gets the attention it deserves because that's the they, they are the, the essential guardrails to the type of bad behaviour um, that we obviously criti criticise China for in terms of how it manages standards. And also more akin to the criticism that it, it, about China's approach, which is in many cases based at the ITU, because it's a government sort of membership based and driv driven organisation. And so it lends itself to the type of coordinated government directed standards approaches, as opposed to industry driven standards bodies, which are the vast majority elsewhere where there are firms from all over the place, there are clear governance arrangements that protect against the type of uh, uh, activities that China goes on there. Um, the one, I suppose, issue besides highlighting sort of concerns about China's growing impact on international standards and what, what it means for uh, good governance of standards is that in reaction to that, especially the European Union has in some ways nearly been copying some of China's problematic approach to standards in that over the last 12 or 18 months, they've enacted a series of laws and regulations that exclude foreign experts from participating in developing standards in Europe. Uh, and that's just not just targeting Chinese uh, participants, for example, it's all foreign experts. And, and it doesn't even need to be sort of sort of European. There can be European technical experts that work for a US firm. They are banned from uh, participating in many standard setting uh, activities in uh, the EU now. And the EU is embedding this sort of like domestic uh, standard setting capability in all of its subsequent le uh, legislation, the AI Act, the Data Act, the European Union cloud certification scheme. And that is essentially sort of uh, contributing to the bifurcation in the international standard system. But Agatha also mentioned that a disproportionately and over sort of powered uh, use of a national security lens by some officials in the Biden administration has also actually fragmented the, um, the international standard system, especially when it comes to uh, uh, Chinese firms that, that they sanction and, and their, their ability to participate in international standards. Thank you, very interesting. Frederick, uh, Nigel has already referred to the EU standardization poly, um, strategy, and you have published this year a paper that focused on this topic. So could you, could you explain very briefly to our audience what is the EU standardization strategy and what are the main takeaways of your analysis? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's very much what we already heard from Nigel in terms of um, the direction of travel in Europe. Um, there was a standardization strategy launched by the European Commission last year, um, which essentially wants to take more political control over the uh, standardization process, especially vis-a-vis -vis, um, these organizations like Etsy, for instance that have substantial participation and of course draws heavily on the technical expertise that comes from from companies basically using this uh, sort of open consensus uh, industry driven type of process in, in in trying to set new telecom standards um, and I think you know if you if you if you want to understand where the commission is coming from I think it's obviously um, um, sort of a broad national security geopolitical analysis that inform um, the development where they're going. But it's not just that. It's also, um, I think, a, a, a growing um, sentiment in Brussels and elsewhere that um, many of these European systems now need to be 
uh, less open to uh, to foreign experts and to foreign companies or to foreign governments. And in this in this sort of technological race, Europe believes it can actually get an advantage by controlling its own standardization process more thoroughly than, than it's done in the past. Um, one of the key proposals that that uh, is in this strategy is to um, make national standardization bodies in Europe to be more powerful and have in Europe to be more powerful and have more of a uh, direct role, uh, more controlling role um, than they've uh, had in the past. And um, I think it's it's perfectly obvious that this is not a strategy which is going to be helpful for Europe. I mean, ironically, one of the selling arguments from the Commission is that they want to speed up the process. They believe the the process of establishing standards have been too slow. Um, it's taken too too long time in order to get what they want to get. But with this process now, where you uh, where you basically decentralize many of the decisions uh, to national standardization bodies, you're most likely going to see that the time uh, that is going to take in order to get to the point where you can make decisions about standards will will uh, will increase. Um, so, in my view, I, I mean, I don't think it's a good, I don't think it's a good strategy for Europe. I think, I mean, as we all know, uh, Europe is very much punching above its weight when it comes to um, uh, norm setting and standard setting. I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, I mean, it's a long time ago now since um, Europe was basically the frontier of innovation in 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 technology, uh, we kept up sort of pretty well in in telecoms and especially cellular technology. Um, um, but when you look at the standards markets more generally, you'll find that these European bodies have had an outside influence on 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 global developments. And I think Europe is well advised in order to maintain that and to avoid that. It's going to make its own system much more exclusive and close to participation from others, because at the end of the day. That is going to lead to uh, a situation where, regardless what type of standard setting we're going to have, there will be less influence for for Europe in the in these in these processes. The point of the paper that were, that we published and that you referenced those guys basically to say that when you look at this type of standardization process, open, industry driven, voluntary, consensus oriented, it has hugely benefited Europe. When you look at the European ICT sector and you compare it to other sectors, you can see that in terms of entrepreneurship, um, new firms, um, the amount of firms participating in output or participating in trade has is is vastly above what you find in comparable sectors. Um, you will of course find that that license royalties and, and trade more generally is 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 a very substantial part of of uh, of the system. So it it has benefited the type of economic development that you want to see that you you help to drive specialization you help companies to be confident that they they don't need to be downstream in order to control the market in order to benefit from from technological development they can actually specialize upstream and they contribute technology that that others can use um uh, and of course, that's you know, it's it, it's a while ago now since you had Nokia and Ericsson producing the handsets and uh, uh, trying to trying to rival with uh, uh, with Apple and the other ones about um, about competing in the downstream market. And if 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 we go towards a system where you as a company need to, need to control the value chain um, in 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 sort of more extensive way than in the past, uh, that's probably going to be bad news for. The likes of Ericsson and Nokia that have been and that remain very strong companies in the sector. Just to add an extra point um, to, to Frederick's point there about, I suppose the, the 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 false promise of seeking greater control in determining country or region specific in the case of Europe standards uh, is in the case with technologies like artificial intelligence, where standard work is actually very tricky and complicated. And there's been existing uh, uh, standards development organisations working on this for years because it's not easy and you need to draw on a global body of expertise to try and answer some of these tricky questions of like, what actually is bias? How do you determine transparency and such? And yet Europe thinks that 
uh, excluding foreign participants from setting AI standards and other standards, that somehow it can short circuit this tricky and complicated process amongst its own officials seems short-sighted to say the least to me. Instead of trying to boost participation in these ongoing areas of work which draw on global expertise and, and trying to help them move quicker, instead of trying to set up your own limited local uh, uh, it's sort of uh, equivalent experts. It's just, I, I just don't see how that works out well for Europe in terms of uh, contributing to the type of standards uh, that will be critical to these new and emerging technologies in a way that as, as, as Frederick said, is that they've actually ironically already been doing through the role of Etsy and others, which have had a disproportionate sort of global influence, especially on telecommunication standards. And so they already have this, this this much valued Brussels effect on standards, yet ironically, they're enacting a series of measures that actually sort of will detract from that uh, as more and more countries and firms sort of engage in these uh, tricky uh, standards for new and emerging technologies. Yeah, and, and I want to go back to some of the topics that Friedrich mentioned, in particular, the role of national standard organizations. But before doing that, let me go to Tom. Tom, your work focuses on global competition and advanced technologies such as 5G. How do you see this discussion of global technological standards fit into the broader topic of technological leadership and the relationship between the United States, China, Europe? Okay, well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with um, such um, um, uh, distinguished panelists. And I, I don't want to rehearse um, the state of play, which um, previous panelists have, have all um, uh, outlined fairly accurately, as far as I can I can tell. Um, but but I would offer just a couple of um, highlights from 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 my perspective. Um, this this question of bifurcation or the difficulties of uh, U.S. and the EU, let alone other countries, um, um, working together constructively in, in international organizations is, is certainly not a new one. It was about, I think, 32 or 33 years ago when I was in the um, George H.W. Bush administration, I was assigned by the National Security Council to open a a dialogue with the European Union on standard setting and cooperation in standard setting. And it was quite a quite a task. We didn't get very far. Um, the US system is was then and it still is to a certain extent fairly disaggregated. Um, and the uh, uh, standards making bodies um, jealously guarded their um, their powers. And we have uh, also the, the additional problem of working with many of the standards, electrical standards, for instance, uh, are controlled by states. Or, and on the other hand, the Europeans at that time certainly didn't want um, um, others to interfere with the work of the, IE, uh, the IEC and the uh, IL, the electrical and the other major standards bodies of, of Europe. Um, but what has happened since then, and, and again, I want to emphasize that I, I do support the ideal case scenario of international cooperation to the extent that we can achieve that. It does result in um, many efficiencies and 5G uh, history of uh, development is, is remarkable as it is, is, is one example of how industry-driven standards have, have um, really had major benefits, economic, um, social, political, uh, for a long time. So the, the one major uh, uh, development in recent years, recent decades, really has been the emergence of China as a global economic superpower. And I would just note a couple of things. There, the mission of China as articulated for many, many years by their leadership, is to become as independent as possible in terms of uh, their economy um, and to become uh, leaders in as many sectors as possible. And they achieve these goals through uh, various means that normally are not acceptable to sort of um, 
Bretton Woods type um, economic system that was uh, proved to be so effective for the last 75 years and things like the WTO. Um, and so their goal in participating in standards, international standards is very um, to achieve as much self-sufficiency and advantage for their firms as is possible. Um, second thing is, and this is something that President uh, uh, von der Leyen has noted, um, in areas that are sensitive like 5G, and increasingly we're going to see this with AI, we're going to see it with quantum computing um, and other areas, um, it's, it's important to just recall that companies in China, as von der Leyen argues, are already obliged by law to assist state intelligence gathering operations and to keep it secret. Now we've had examples in uh, the evolution of, of um, telecommunication system where Huawei has become so important. Uh, we have the famous case of the um, the uh, African Development or African Cooperation Union, uh, where Huawei put in technology which had a backdoor, and everything that was done uh, came across their uh, their their uh, servers was sent back to Shanghai. Uh, more recently, it, it's clear that this idea that Chinese companies have to serve the interests of the, the Chinese state uh, has been noted um, in the in the operations of TikTok, where um, they have basically used the, the records of uh, TikTok to uh, acquire information on whoever they wanted to acquire information on in the United States. More recently, it's become uh, uh, been reported that uh, TikTok also cooperated with the Chinese authorities to identify uh, um, uh, demonstrators uh, in Hong Kong 2019-2020 um, who were opposing the takeover of Hong Kong, the effective takeover of Hong Kong. So um, we should do as much as we can to cooperate amongst ourselves, among especially Europe, United States, Japan, like-minded countries to work cooperatively with an industry-led uh, standards-making system. But we probably are going to have to uh, discriminate um, between really sensitive technologies uh, such as 5G communications uh, systems, um, but increasingly um, uh, artificial intelligence perhaps electric vehicles because of the need for cross-border data flows to uh, uh, in an international context, um, quantum computing. But there are areas that are not so sensitive. But I, I know that the, the Train Technology Council proudly announced that they were, we were going to cooperate across the Atlantic on the uh, electric charging stations. Uh, um, which is a good idea. The Chinese are going to benefit from that because they're going to be controlling the electric vehicle industry anyway. So it's probably beneficial to have them participate. So we have to make that distinction. So let me leave it there. There are many more specific issues that I, Erska, I know you want to get into, but uh, let me leave it, my comments uh, at that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Agatha, actually, I would like to hear your opinion. During your introduction, you emphasized the importance of maintaining global, the global standardization system. So what can we do better while addressing some of the concerns that Tom just outlined? Uh, absolutely. It's actually a great segue because, um, as I mentioned, we have uh, six main recommendations in the paper. And, uh, of course, I encourage everyone to have a look because they are pretty detailed. Um, but the point of those recommendations is to say that uh, it is okay and it's actually very good that nations around the world, and especially advanced economies, are thinking about geopolitical, geopolitical risk more seriously today because that's probably been kind of set aside a little bit too much in the past. But the key is to tackle those growing geopolitical anxieties while preserving what can be preserved and what's been value creating for our economy societies for so long. And so we, we go on to six recommendations in the paper. And, and the first one of them is exactly what we just heard, which is to really focus attention and resources on the most sensitive industries and technologies. Uh, because at the end of the day, 
um, if, if you focus on this, there's probably 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the world's global standards, global technical standards that can be left out. Uh, we did um, a similar exercise in 2020 where we said, OK, let's take everything that the EU is worried about in terms of its um, economic security, national security with China. And let's see and code every single line of um, Europe's investment in China, Chinese investment in Europe, European trade with China both ways and see what remains. And the finding was pretty amazing. We found that probably 75% of bilateral trade and 65% of bilateral investment is absolutely, absolutely non-sensitive. And even within these categories, you probably could set aside a whole lot more kind of, uh, within the sensitive categories, you could set aside a whole lot more that is actually fine once you've mitigated for it through investment screening, certain export controls, et cetera. And so, um, if you apply that to standards, I, I would imagine you find the same, if not more. I think, you know, just looking at my table here, most of what surrounds me is um, shaped and driven by global technical standards, is a better product because of it, um, but don't need any kind of concern, any kind of concern, any kind of action there. So leaving aside what can be left aside, leaving away and not touching uh, the least sensitive industries and technologies is a very, very important point, but one that needs to be repeated again and again. We're not speaking about the whole of um, the economy, the whole of the kind of standardizable world. Uh, so that's the, the first one. The second one is, um, in fact, to monitor China's actions, uh, because if nothing's happened so far, and if uh, China's influence hasn't been that great and that important, so far, which is Niger's point, and is really reflected in a lot of excellent research by different stakeholders. The NIST report that was done by the Eggs of Arab, the Atlantic Council report that was done a few years ago. I mean, uh, excellent research that shows that China's actions to date and China's influence to date is actually pretty limited or at least not that effective. Uh, it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be monitored. It doesn't mean that in the future we couldn't be uh, finding concerning uh, behavior. And so monitoring uh, is important to check misbehavior, but it's also important to make everyone feel better about what they're doing and just as a, as a, as a means to preserve confidence in the system. So monitoring is a very important part of this. And as a matter of fact, the EU and the US are already doing it in the context of the TTC. So what we're saying in the paper is do more, continue doing it. And we, we kind of um, detail what's most concerning and what should be traced. There are really four main concerns with Chinese participation in global standardization system, coordinated voting, forum shopping, this impression of gaining the system by um, securing key leadership technical position and then just exploding working groups with proposals. I think monitoring of those four kinds of behavior is a very, very good basis to get everyone to just trust the system a little bit more. Uh, a key finding, and everyone's been saying it, but it is worth saying it again, is that uh, part of China's influence building is because of uh, a retreat from Europe and, and the US from global standards, certain global standard settings and the development organization. And so uh, the, the, the solution is to invest more rather than less um, in global technical standards. Uh, strengthen the governance of certain international standard organizations. The main concern really is around the ITU, and um, there's there's a number of recommendations in the paper about that particular organization um, to really make everyone once again feel better as you age some of the concerns around China's behavior. Um, and then two more kind of um, open-ended um, suggestions and, and recommendations um, bring try and bring a lot of the political, strategic, national security discussions around standard within those mini lateral. They exist, they have a standard purview, they have standard discussions that are on the agenda. Use those to make sure that the very heavy, important questions around standards that have to do with resilience and national security and economic security are tackled so that everyone feels they've had that conversation and can leave the, the, the once again, private-driven, commercially-driven organizations uh, do their work once those been tackled. Um, so very important to actually create a space for the discussion to happen uh, within mini laterals potentially is, is one of the, the ways I could see that happen. And then very important, and uh, this is about China's uh, technological competitiveness, making sure to solve uh, the, the more peripheral issues um, through targeted and effective tools beyond standard. What I mean here is that Part of the concern around China's influence in telecommunication standards as part of uh, the picture 
is because of China's incredibly fast growing market share in the sector that hasn't got much to do with standard, has a lot to do with Chinese policies um, of support, Chinese market closure that has just built the scale for Huawei and ZT and other players in China. And so um, don't try and solve this much bigger issue with uh, a complete overall of standards and standards organization. Instead, tackle those issues with the proper tool, bigger tool, uh, which can include the foreign service instrument that the EU is putting in place, which can include some of the policies the US is thinking about in terms of trade uh, defense, uh, but really uh, standards would be just throwing a very, very small cotton ball at a very big problem. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the main takeaways. Thank you. Uh, Nigel, switching gears, the United States has also published its own standardization strategy just a month ago or so. What do you think are the main points of the US strategy and do you think it's a step in the right direction? I think the standard, uh, the, the US strategy was underwhelming to say the least, uh, especially in comparison to the, the detailed prescriptive uh, uh, strategy that the European Union outlined, even if it was leads to misguided and, and, and sort of bad outcomes. But it's critical to recognize it was the US national standard strategy for critical and emerging technologies. It was not the US standard strategy, which is generally what it has been called and, and what it was portrayed. And that reflects the fact that the Biden administration uh, generally sees technical standards through a disproportionately powerful lens of national security. And I get it, there are clear and legitimate concerns about Chinese firms and standards playing a greater role, but an overpowered national security lens le leads to bad outcomes in terms of undermining international uh, um, uh, international standard system. Um, unfortunately, it, it includes many commendable recommendations about supporting R&D that ultimately leads to new technologies and standards, uh, deepening sort of standards expertise in the government uh, and, and in the workforce and encouraging more uh, sort of uh, academic researchers or technical experts from engaging in standards work. Um, but ultimately, it seemed to more reflect a grab bag of existing measures that relate to standards um, without actually providing sort of new, clear funding and support and action that 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 would set the strategy apart from what the US was doing in in uh, previously. And in some regards actually signaled, besides the disproportionate national security focus, also signaled a, a worrying uh, lack of support for the core principles that underpin the international standard system as reflected by the World Trade Organization's technical barriers to trade uh, uh, annex, which details like transparency, consensus-based decision and such. The strategy mentions the principles without mentioning the WTO. And that was done uh, on purpose after months of internal disputes between the national security folks and the, the rest of the government who recognize the critical role that these WTO principles play in, in providing a guardrail and, and safeguards against the type of sort of nefarious Chinese influences that we're worried about. And so, um, but then finally sort of, it also included recommendations that touch on the points Ag Agatha makes, which I, I fully agree with in terms of like, it, because uh, standards making is a predominantly private sector driven activity. Governments play a very minor role in directly setting standards. And so what then matters is ensuring that there's clear, good communication, good information sharing and transparency between government officials who understand how technical standards are made and the standard development organizations that are working on uh, the types of technologies that are deemed sort of sensitive as Agatha was talking about so that they understand exactly what's going on, who's doing what, why are they doing it. Um, but that is crucial to them having a level of assurance, as Agatha mentioned, that what's happening in international standards is as it should be, and there is no undue influence uh, happening there. And that's a critical part of the puzzle, which I still don't think they've gotten down well. There's some, I suppose, some positive uh, announcement at the TTC, but it's really the bare minimum. And we haven't seen the type of really detailed, in-depth international information sharing and cooperation between like-minded partners that, that really should be happening. 
at the ITU and at other SDOs. It's still at a very superficial level, and that's highly problematic, and that needs to expand. And the US strategy really didn't provide much new of anything that 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 would build on uh, that that would address this underlying issue about ensuring the US government is fully across what is happening in standards development bodies uh, relating to new and emerging technologies. And that's that should be an easy win. That should be an easy get. And yet this administration still hasn't um, developed a coherent action plan to address its concerns around technical strategy, uh, technical standards. And I think that this strategy sort of was a missed opportunity there for them to clearly put out what they're worried about, why they're worried about it, and, and new funding support and mechanisms to sort of address those underlying concerns. Thanks. Uh, Friedrich, let me get back to you. We have seen this general trend of moving away from public standardization and the recognition of the importance of industry participation in the standardization process. As Nigel mentioned, that's like the tradition in the United States. But we have seen this also elsewhere, including in China. Yet the European Commission with this EU standardization strategy seems to be going in the opposite direction, as you mentioned, giving more power to public bodies, national standardization organization. What is your view on this strategy? So, I mean, in the first place, I don't think it's a strategy which is going to be beneficial to Europe's own economic development. Um, I think it's easy to see where Europe is coming from. Um, in addition to the national security, uh, technological competition issues that we already have discussed here, um, Europe itself is pretty occupied by the idea that it's going to be the main regulator for many of the new technologies that are going to emerge. And in that process, it has developed a distrust of um, individual companies and those who participate in, in these dialogues. Um, so I think that's, that's necessary in order to understand where Europe is coming from. It's, it's sort of a, a shift in the ideological orientation um, when it comes to the extent to which that you're prepared to rely on uh, the technical expertise and the broad orientational technological development that that is brought by by company experts and of course by foreign company experts. It would probably have been a different thing if it was only European company experts that, that participated or if it was only European companies that were uh, leading on many of these new emerging uh, technological standards that that's going to come, but of course that's not the case. So I think that's that's important to uh, in order to understand why Europe is doing is doing this. The other the other part I think is is um, perhaps less obvious, but there is also a sort of a growing uh, tendency in much of European technological policies that they're using regulations in order to carve up the markets and to make decisions about which sectors or even which companies um, that are going to stand to benefit the most from different types of developments. Um, this industrial policy um, uh, hold over standardization policies and, and a, sort of a slew of other type of regulatory policies is getting stronger and stronger. And I think this is what we've seen sort of in the broader dialogue about the standardization strategy as well, which is that, you know, when you when you begin to run the economic analysis and when you begin to try to figure out, so who do they think is going to pay more and who do they think is going to pay less as a consequence of the changes they are bringing into the system? And I'm not just talking about the standardization strategy now, but a host of other policies that have come as well. You can see that, you know, there are a couple of countries that have been remarkably influential in, and of course, sectors that have been remarkably influential in lobbying the European Commission in, to go in certain directions. So it is this sort of the consequence of a, of a low growth economy where every sector, every country have to sharpen their elbows in order to maximize the gains that they bring in from, from a different system. You don't have that 
sort of broad visionary generosity, which is that, well, well, we try to establish the institutions here and then we want firms to compete as much as possible um, about what's going to sort of happen in the future in, in the technology and in the markets. And whatever that that sort of direction will be, there will be sort of enough gains for everyone. At the end of the day, it's the consumers that stands to benefit and that's, that's what we want to achieve. But that philosophy is not underpinning European policy anymore. It's much more this... There's an underlying um, industrial policy sentiment, which, you know, t- to be uh, a bit more frank and direct about it, which is that, you know, it's if you it take sort of uh, telecom or cellular uh, standards, but what they really think is that, uh, well, at the end of the day, there will be automobile, automotive companies and the Internet of Things companies that in this process is, is, is going to manage to get uh, a sort of a better deal uh, from technology than if we would maintain a system and we would sort of protect the type of institutions that we have in underpinning the system today. Just to yeah. um, add, add a brief point to, to Frederick's uh, analysis of the EU's increasing use of technical standards for protectionism is that it provides a context for the EU-US Trade and Technology Council in that simultaneously while they're uh, proclaiming that they want to work with the United States as a value sharing partner on standards relating to new and emerging technologies, they're simultaneously excluding uh, US firms and foreign experts from how they set standards. And which inherently narrows how much work they can actually do together. So the announcement about EV charging sort of standards is is great, but like it should be like the very bare minimum of what the two sides can actually work together on. They're doing some other useful work on AI, but like it's also similarly sort of secondary or tangential to EU's other main effort in regards to AI standards. And so there's just Europe is 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 sort of full steam ahead in using technical standards for industrial policy. And the Biden administration just isn't willing to call them out on it. it it's prioritizing essentially good vibes uh, over on the relationship in ter- instead of like holding the Europeans to account for them to act up, uh, to live up to what they're saying they want to do with the United States on technical standards. Tom, did you have a comment? Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, associate myself with um, Friedrich's remarks, um, and and I'm going to oversimplify here. But uh, this I, this uh, evolution of thinking both in Europe and the United States about industrial policy, I think is a is a uh, um, a re- really negative sign for our economies and for our ability to cooperate. Um, you see that in the semiconductor industry where we're sort of competing to see who can uh, appropriate the most money to subsidize the, the domestic producers. Um, and to my way of thinking, that it's uh, from a purely economic point of view, it, it's a negative um, for efficiency. Um, but uh, in the real world in which we operate, uh, China is uh, now the world's second biggest economy. They're putting a huge amount of money into technological research that flows over into their efforts to uh, be more influential or control standards making. So to my way of thinking, we need to um, step back a little bit on our uh, pursuit of industrial policies and we call them different things in the United States and in, in Europe, but that's essentially what they are. And um, one negative example that I want, wanted to bring up um, is this, uh, it's not only standards making, but it's also enforcing standards. And we have this dispute now between Europe and the United States on this um, proposed rule about uh, uh, SEP standard uh, essential patents um, that um, remarkably uh, appeared sort of out of nowhere to my way of uh, my observations um, from the European Commission, um, which would allow the Commission and a regulatory body within the Commission that knows, admits that it knows little about 
patents because it's the trademark agency. So they will be given the power to um, determine what really are con constitute standard essential patents and then uh, control uh, in many ways the pricing of those. The ones who are gonna be hurt the most of that are the innovative companies um, in, in the telecom sector, for instance, uh, the software uh, and design companies in the United States and in the infrastructure companies in Europe. And the ones who will benefit from this are of course the Chinese phone makers um, because the Chinese have already tried to basically undermine uh, patents which apply to uh, the cell phone industry, the mobile telephony industry. So uh, to me, that's a remarkable development, uh, which is somewhat inexplicable. Uh, we should really be trying to uh, combine our resources to understand what the Chinese are doing, to uh, combine our both political and economic um, efforts to uh, making sure that the standards industry-led standard system, which has been so beneficial both to producers and to consumers, uh, that that is not undermined by the Chinese. And um, this uh, proposed rule goes against the grain of, of that summit, I think. Yeah, I think great points, not but Friedrich and you, Tom, pointed out that, well, it's not only about the standardization strategies, about all the policies that are adopted and how they influence the standardization ecosystem. I know we are running out of time, but perhaps just the last question, Agatha, Nigel, or everyone, actually. So it seems my takeaway from this discussion is this, despite these geo geopolitical tensions, there seems to be an overall the agreement that overall the standardization system is working quite well. There were some abuses, there were some challenges in the past, but in a way, uh, self-regulation has worked. Uh, we need to keep an eye. We need to keep following what is going on. And there is a need for cooperation. But what would be, would be your recommendation for policymakers? Can the adoption of certain policies have unintended consequences and be more harmful than inaction? Or what, what are your concluding remarks for this topic? I'm happy to take a first swing and it, it, it builds on something Agatha said in that um, there are hundreds of standards development organisations and tens of thousands of standards that work at perfectly fine and as they should. And so in terms of what policymakers should be focused on, it is on those uh, sort of cutting edge critical technologies that have uh, sort of dual use capabilities and such. Um, the other thing as a part of that focus is recognising the role of standards as compared to laws and regulations. Standards are not meant, they're not a silver bullet meant to solve anything and everything. They play a distinct role and their development is a distinct role. They're, they're typically uh, a follow on uh, activity from laws and regulation. And so it's putting the role of standards in its proper context in and alongside domestic laws and regulations, which address sort of uh, some of the same but different issues that 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 are, uh, are raised in the context of standards um, because and I mentioned that because too often in debates about standards that are quite often especially in Europe concerns about values embedded within those standards and that can easily sort of lead to some of the problematic uh, we see in Europe and so instead of looking at standards as these silver bullet sort of things that address everything to do uh, with a technology, putting them in their proper context and recognising that a country's laws and regulations have a far bigger impact on societal values and concerns uh, relating to new and emerging technologies and to address them with those tools, rather than trying to overload technical standards and standards of development organisations in making them sort of fully responsible for everything to do with new and emerging technology. So, Again, it comes back to fully understanding what technical standards are, how they're made, the role they play, uh, and and ensuring that governments are fully across that, in and alongside, obviously, parallel work they're doing on laws and regulations and cooperation with counterparts from other countries. Thank you. Agatha, 
Um, I agree exactly with uh, what Nigel said. Uh, the only addition is uh, for policymakers to bring back economics in national security discussion, because there's no, if, if, even in the most geopolitically set um, of assumptions, geopolitical set, uh, sorry, set of assumptions, um, winning the competition with China and winning the technological race with China can't happen without good companies and healthy companies and vibrant companies and dynamic companies. And so economics is part of national security. Um, and so just repeating that again and again and making sure that we don't forget um, that they're the bedrock of uh, what we want to build for the future. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Friedrich and Tom, do you have any concluding remarks? I think my only point would be, I mean, following on what Agata just said, which is that I mean, if you really want to see these as a technological race between countries and countries with different value system and different geopolitical targets or directions, then at the end of the day, it's a strong economy and it's strong firms that are going to maintain the edge that Western Western economies have over authoritarian economies like China. And that means having sort of a policy which promotes much more investment into R&D uh, that promotes more Schumpeterian growth with uh, um, sort of tough competition between firms that are going to knock out a few firms, but there's going to be new technological developments that will be developed in a market pro-competitive way. Um, that's the way That's the way you're going to sort of build the economic strength that is necessary here. There's no way you can use the standard system in order to gain an advantage uh in in sort of that broader context you need you need to bring the substance in order to win that race yeah couldn't agree more tom well um very quickly um i think the role of transatlantic government to government cooperation in this arena is mostly um two things one monitoring chinese efforts to um, sort of game the system to use inadequate um, um, patent applications and technology um, uh, and uh, to coordinate a, a, a position that uh, can be rammed through the international standards organizations. And when that sort of behavior is, is apparent, then it would be useful for to use diplomatic means to call the Chinese out on that. And I think that's a good good role for the two governments. Um, uh, for the US, I would like to see a little bit more uh, support from uh, the government sector for small and medium enterprises to participate in uh, international standards making bodies because sometimes it's just simply too uh, too much of a financial burden to um, send people over wherever the um, the, the stand making bodies are meeting. Uh, on the EU side, I would like to see uh, in its effort to be the regulatory superpower, um, this application of the same um, standards if in values, if you will, such as privacy vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis Chinese firms as they scrutinize American firms. Um, I just don't understand why, um, you know, the attention to Facebook or um, other US social platforms, which is not reciprocated by attention to the, the Chinese social platforms, which are used, uh, it's more and more clear for nefarious um, purposes by, by the Chinese and whose uh, practices in protecting privacy are uh, probably worse than those of the, the American-based platforms. So that's uh, that's all I would, would want to uh, end up with here. Thanks. Thank you. And with this, I think we have come to the end of our event. I would like to thank our speakers for a very interesting discussion. It was my pleasure to have you virtually at the Hudson Institute, and I hope to be able to host you again soon. Thank you everyone for joining.